very warm welcome to this year's festival, in which we have no fewer than 64 events taking place between now and next Friday, 23rd October, exploring this theme of fabrication. We've got debates, panel discussions, lectures, readings, film screenings, performances, <coughs> exhibitions, and walking tours. There's also the uh, installation out in the quad, DNA to it, um, which will grow and transform mm -hmm. in the course of the, the festival. So do take the opportunity this week to, to go and interact with and contribute to the fabrication of that installation. All our events are open to everyone. <coughs> Most of them are free to attend as well. This is a time like no other when the faculty throws open its doors and celebrates the culture of daring and discovery that we foster the Age of Kings. Throwing doors open sounds easy, um, but actually it isn't. Um, so I just want to thank very briefly some of the people who are involved in organising and running this year's festival. In the Arts and Humanities Research Institute, my thanks go to my colleague, Professor Matt Saunders, who was director of the Institute and director of the festival, as being the great enthuser, the great enabler behind everything uh, that we're doing as part of this great construct. My thanks too to Panaja Heis, the Alcatraz Manager of the Institute, Laura Douglas, the Enterprising Events Administrator, and the Indefatigable Events Officers, Alex Creighton, Daniel Daly, and Tom Scale. My colleagues in the Faculty's Communications team have been responsible for promoting the festival, and they will hear in such large numbers, suggest that they've done that uh, very well. And my thanks too to the university teams who make running an event like this possible. So I'm thinking of people in AV, especially James Hare, um, King's Venues, especially Ian Hughes, Estates, and Caterham. So the theme of this year's <coughs> festival is fabrication. And in a moment we're going to hear some of our best philosophers discussing the fabrication <coughs> of morality. Where do morals come from? So I want to prepare the way for them by turning back briefly to one of their forebears in the great continental tradition, the 18th century French philosopher Denis Diderot, in whom I have something of a vested interest. His own interests were, in part at least, vestimentary. And in particular, Diderot had a thing about stockings. So much so that he devotes an expansive 20,000 word lyrical article to them in his vast encyclopédie, that, that great Bible of the Enlightenment, which he co-edited with the magnificent down there. Now, not simply are stockings a sign of the growth in manufacture and trade that Diderot celebrated so much in the 18th century, more powerfully still, mm -hmm. they become in his hands the very image of the workings of human reason. Diderot wrote this in 1752, I translate. The stocking-making loom is one of the most complicated and most logical machines known to humankind. It can be thought of as a single and unique reasoning, the conclusion of which is the fabrication of the stocking itself. Its various parts are so strongly interdependent that if you just take away one of them, or alter the form of those deemed to be the least important, then you damage the entire mechanism. Here, the epic of the matter is simultaneously the epic of the mind. The fabrication of a stocking is an image of nothing less than the pursuit of logic, the progress of reason. Here, we have the syllogism as stocking. For those of you who are interested in uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, you may remember in his Reverie, it's precisely his glimpsing of a stocking factory while out 
walking in sublime countryside that confirms once and for all his disenchantment from the modern world that makes him a representative of what we now call counter-enlightenment. Stockings divide opinion. Their fabrication is a controversial business. So this is just one example, I think, of how fundamental fabrication is to how we perceive the world and our place in it, including notions of progress and self-improvement, ranging as it does across a semantic field from construction to falsehood, from making something to making a forgery, from something formed by art to something devised in order to deceive, fabrication in all its permissimi takes us, I think, to the very heart of the humanities today. When we study fabrication, we seek, for instance, to understand how texts work, how and to what ends texts are put together into a verbal fabric. When we study fabrication, we seek to understand how things are made up, by which I mean both invented and falsified. When we study fabrication, we also see a better understanding of psychology and law, for instance, patients confabulating, witnesses giving false evidence. The fundamental ambiguity of fabrication is crucial to the study of the humanities today. It stands very neatly for the critical attitude and process of rereading that institutions of learning like King's bring to research on the world around us. So if you want to find out more about fabrication, come to more events in this festival. Copies of the festival brochure are available around the building uh, and also online. So please don't be shy. You're also very welcome to attend the opening reception in the Great Hall at 8 o'clock this evening. But before the manufactured froth of fizzy wine, we have the meat of a finely honed debate between some of our sharpest minds. So I'm going to hand over to my colleagues in philosophy. As I do so, let me wish you a very enjoyable evening. And please join with me in wishing this year's Arts and Humanities Festival every success. <coughs> So the weak 
as he saw it within the society, had invented, had fabricated this system of values in order to control those who might physically harm or oppress them. And from this first fabrication, as he saw it, countless others grew. So we began to fabricate ourselves as well as our moral values. And the example he gave for, a, for that is perhaps best illustrated with the notion of meekness. So before what we now call morality, there were weak people. There were people who were un, unwilling, unable, too scared of that. Once the fabrication had happened, that was no longer weakness. It was no longer they were too scared or unable to stand up for themselves. It had become meekness that they chose not to. They chose not to fight back because they were above that kind of thing. They were better than that. So as he sees it, this initial fabrication, the invention of this value system, is used to control society by giving power to those who lack physical force. And the price for this is a certain delusion about ourselves. The delusions this is attached to are notions like free will, that I chose to turn the other cheek rather than simply that I'm a weak and cowardly person. So as Nietzsche sees that morality is a fabrication. So it was not handed down on tablets from heaven, for there were no such tablets. And it was not the product of a social contract, for no such contract has ever been signed nor acquiesced in. And it was not the result of a rational proof, for no such proof has ever been given. It was, as he puts it, the human or too human product of a political power struggle. Now, what's distinctive about Nietzsche, perhaps explains why I call him the quintessentially modern thinker, is that we're used to the idea that morality might be challenged by lust or violence or greed. You want something, and morality wants it, and there's a challenge there. But what's distinctive about Nietzsche is the idea, or perhaps what he best exemplifies, is the idea that what challenges morality is a kind of knowledge. On the one hand, morality is challenged by the knowledge we prove in the hard sciences. We learn in the hard sciences that what is out there is a world of particles and motion and spin and extension with no apparent place for notions of right or wrong or free choice <coughs> or rights. When physics takes its fundamental inventory of things, it's not going to include ideas like right and wrong. That's one part of what's driving it. Another part is what we learn from the soft sciences from, say, history or psychology. And he thinks that we've got to a point now where we can go back and do the history of our own morality, just as we might do the sociology of some foreign group that we've encountered. And we can do the history of our morality, and we can see the chance, non-linear, messy, messy process that led to it. So, for example, one of the topics is transition from Roman to Christian morality. How many battles did that take? How many battles that were only narrowly run? How many bribes? How much resentment and ambition of the people involved? And his view is that when you see it like that, when you see what soil our morality grew on, you cannot regard it in the way that we have previously regarded it. You cannot regard it as simply some kind of great given that we must all follow. You see it on the contrary, the historical and contingent artifact and one entirely open to question. So that's his view on the origin of morality. <coughs> I want to end just by saying something about the implications of this. Now, his feeling is not that when you know these things, morality is then automatically ridiculous, automatically to be annulled completely. But he thinks that it is radically, radically transformed. So suppose you and I are having an argument about something, and you say, oh, but he has a right to do that. Now, one way I could respond is by saying, well, no, I don't think he has a right to do that, because I think these other people have different rights, or there's a clash of rights, there's a right to privacy here, or there's a right to public knowledge. We might have a discussion about it. What Nietzsche does is shift the structure of the debate here. So rather than responding by appealing to another right, he thinks I should ask a very different kind of question. I should ask questions like this. In what sense do we think they're rights at all? Where do they fit into our scientific picture of the world? At what point did they enter our discourse? When did people start talking about rights? 
what kind of individual, what kind of psychology would find this talk comforting, rewarding, and powerful? And above all, who benefits from this talk? Which of the social groups benefit from the idea that the right talk has become dominant? At a local level, at a national level, at an international level. Who is benefiting from the presence of this concept in discourse? So what you have in Nietzsche is this idea of a fabrication. Morality is a political power play by a certain group of people. And his view is not that we must then simply discard it, but we must change how we see it. When we understand its origin, we must change how we see it. And we should see it in a way that gives us simultaneously a new caution. So we don't just take it on as given anymore. A new caution, but also, he thinks, then a new boldness. When we see that it is historical, that it's shiftable, that it's political, that it's psychological, that it's economic, when we see what it emerges from, we can also see how we can discard bits of it, challenge bits of it, ask who benefits from bits of it, and change bits of it. So that is the Nietzschean picture. And what I now want to do is hand over to Dr. Jochen Abzai, who's going to give us an angle and a passport. <coughs> that 
conventional morality, nomos, is a convergence <coughs> of belief to shackle the strong. And secondly, he thinks that the natural norms say that the strong should exploit the weak to further their own goals and self development. So, just as Sasha just outlined, uh, the political um, thing that the weak part, okay, we have to have these laws to somehow get the better of these strong people who otherwise will crush us. Okay, so Calicles um, now thinks this is a huge mistake um, precisely because these made up laws, the laws, they don't have the sort of authority that natural laws have. So he thinks that what is conventionally just um, is in fact radically opposed to what is just by nature. So he thinks that following the accepted moral code is in fact immoral. So he proposes a radical <coughs> inversion of values and urges us to abandon the standard accepted moral code. Or at least, and that is again something that Sasha already said, or at least to acknowledge that the moral code which we follow isn't something that is grounded in anything super special, anything that is grounded in reality. Okay, um, now, in a different dialogue, a different character, Protagoras expresses the widely felt worry that if we adopt Caliclean morality, human life has been always put on if possible. He thinks that without exercising cooperative attitudes such as justice or self-restraint, we would all perish. Um, so, in the interest of survival, it is in human nature <coughs> to be cooperative rather than cutthroat. So, developing these cooperative attitudes, he thinks, is not a stunting of human nature, as Kalikli says, but rather it is a completion of human nature. Um, so Protagoras seeks to defend conventional morality as having its special status by showing how it is founded in our nature. Okay, so, and now in response to those thinkers, uh, we come to Plato and Aristotle. Plato thinks that the foundation of morality transcends human nature. Ultimately, it is the form of the good, um, an entity that in no way depends on <coughs> any sort of cognition, human or divine cognition, the morality ultimately is founded in the form of the good, and that is something that is simply that is in fact the most basic thing uh, that could be there. Aristotle rejects Plato's form of the good for various metaphysical and practical reasons. He thinks that nothing like the form of the good could possibly play the practical role that the highest human good is supposed to play. And that is happiness. In fact, Plato and Aristotle agree to a large extent. Both think that happiness is the highest human good, which means that happiness alone is the most final end. It is that for the sake of which everything else is done. On the role of practical wisdom, and practical wisdom is that which enables successful practical agency, on that role, Plato and Aristotle partly agree, partly disagree. Both agree that only a life governed by practical wisdom can be good and happy for the reasons that um, your life has to have a certain shape and direction. Um, also, the good life is a life of virtue, and only virtue imbues your good traits of character with the, um, well, wisdom and authority that virtues have. And finally, the practical, the practically wise person knows what to do in any given particular situation. So practical wisdom is essential to living a good life, a life of virtue. Now to the disagreements. For Plato, both the virtues in the abstract and derivatively, the instantiated virtues and virtuous actions depend for their identity on their relation to the form of the good, insofar as they are good things. So for Plato, the practically wise person, her agency, will consist in determining just or courageous things in action, ultimately by reference to the form of the good. So once you have the knowledge of the form of the good, you can see and spot um, what things are to be done. You identify 
why that was arranged by just because we have this knowledge um, of the form of the Okay, so basically this is a recognition of the picture where morality is founded on something and the good person goes around and recognizes that and acts accordingly. Now Aristotle rejects the form of the good. So how can he found or what can he found for the laws? Well, Aristotle goes back to human nature in a way. Um, he, in particular, deals with the human function, which he identifies with the capacity to reason in various ways. So he thinks that the best human life is, in a way, also the most human life, and that's the life that is centered on the best reasoning that we human beings are capable of. And that, uh, conveniently, is the reasoning involved in acting virtuously. Okay, um, unlike Plato, Aristotle does not think that we can identify the virtues or virtuous actions by reference to something that transcends human practice. Nor does he think, as perhaps do Calicles and Protagoras, that we can establish which character traits count as virtues merely by investigating human nature. Rather, he thinks that the traits which count as virtues are agreed upon by people with practical intellect. So it is a function of wisdom or practical wisdom to identify certain traits as virtues and not only identify them in the sense of recognizing them, but by establishing them as virtues. So in a way, um, how exactly we are to understand, understand let's say, courage or justice, that is something that is determined by the activity of practical reason. But um, that doesn't mean that the moral norms that stem from that are merely made up. Because Aristotle thinks that this practical reason that we are using that, again, is something that is in our nature. So in a way, he can found, um, so he can rely on the authority of nature to found morality without entirely Um, and 
Also around this time, there was a, an explosion uh, discovering about different cultures, which there hadn't been for a long time. A lot of these cultures were quite insular, <coughs> and they discovered an awful lot of cultural variety in moral standards. And this threw a lot of the uh, theorists into a certain amount of crisis. What do you do when you discover that different cultures have sometimes radically different uh, attitudes towards death? For example, um, so it seemed like the discovery of new cultures was again progressing through science, so what were we to do? And in this culture, more theories, a bit like Kavite's theory, and a bit like Nietzsche's theory before Nietzsche uh, came about. For example, someone else I worked on, Bernard Mandel, who said, here's, here's the story. There's lots of people in society. They're all very competitive. They all want the same resources. But a long time ago, when societies were forming, a small group of them, a small percentage of society, let's just call them the 1%, decided, what if we could have more of the resources? How would we do that? And so we're all equally competitive. We said, well, we'll do this. We'll tell people there's something else they get called virtue. And that's really, really valuable. But to do that, you've got to withhold your desires. You want that other person to take, obviously, but you can't have it, but don't worry, by not taking it off and gain something else called virtue. And the most competitive people now will try to be the most virtuous. They will withhold all their desires, but be more capable. These theories have <laughs> gone on. As long as there's been theories about morality, there have been conspiracy theories about morality. There's nothing like a conspiracy theory, especially when one is feeling one's moral obligations as trouble. When you have to help someone in need and you're tired, there's nothing like a conspiracy theory telling you that morality was invented by some 1% uh, in a room somewhere. The theories, the details of this theories are all sort of dodgy. Where was this room where they all came up with this? Exactly. Was it the Bilderberg group? Who did this? How did they promulgate it? How did we all come to believe it? Are any of the stories that were told by Calates or Mandel or Nietzsche as compelling? Do they have any steps in their argument that are as compelling as the recognition that someone in need needs help and ought to be given? Rousseau thought not, and Kant thought not as well. But he needed to try and rehabilitate the idea, he thought, against Rousseau, against this notion of the abandoned science. And he thought that we could, he thought that we could by looking a little bit more about how science actually works. There's some thought that, well, if morality is just fabricated, it just comes from us, it's just subjective. And what we want is to go out there, like good scientists, and discover morality in the world. But that's how scientists work, right? But Kant said that's not how scientists work. At least the highest standard of knowledge that we have, for example, is mathematics, like geometry. There, we have no need to go out and demand anything and see that the world is thus and so in order to prove that three sides of a triangle, the internal elements of a triangle, are combination of degrees. You don't need any experimentation in order to know that. You can know that just by asking the own demands of your reason, of your own rational consciousness. There is a shift in things we need to make, and we see that all the great scientists do it. They don't look to the world to confirm their theories. They come up with their theories and they demand that the world obey it. We use mathematics now to describe everything about the empirical world. We demand that it accept the structure of our theories. So he thinks you need to look to the subject as, as he calls it, the tribunal of reason. That's, it's your own rational consciousness that decides what's right and wrong. And this is a significant shift. If you make this shift, then you might think that just because something is fabricated by the subject, it's fabricated by your own rational standards, doesn't mean it's merely subjective. Not if rational standards are objective, like they are in mathematics. Then why not, at least potentially, why not in morality? And he had another worry about thinking that uh, morality might not be from the subject. He thinks it had better be from the subject. Because it's only really binding if you view yourself as the final judge of what's the right or wrong thing to do. There's something worrying, I think, if it turned out that one wants to ask what's the right thing to do and then read it in the book and said, oh, okay. 
if that was new knowledge to them for the first time, if Moses didn't write on the tablets and read, Thou shalt not kill, he said, Oh, really? I know that. As if it had never occurred to him prior. <laughs> if it had never occurred to him prior to read things on the tablets, would he have been a moral agent if he decided this is the right thing to do just upon reading? What's his motivation for doing it? I should not kill because it's written in the book, and I want to do what the book says. I want to say it's the very opposite of having a moral conscience, of being moral motivated. And Kant wants to suggest that that actually generalizes. If you look anywhere else, to any other source, and say it comes from this book, or that book, or this history, or that convention, or this biological determining factor, and say, well, I should do it because of that, then one is being moral. One is being moral only if it's one's own rational consciousness demands it. If your own, they're just lawyers giving you the information, at the end of the day, you're the judge. It's only a matter of time before uh, Apple bring out some, some, a guide for moral behavior. I am moral. <laughs> if you impulse when you're in a morally difficult situation, <coughs> you'll just click it and it'll say, how that will be your possible. <laughs> Imagine that you lived your life constantly just picking up your phone, checking up behaviors, and you did everything the prime morals demanded of you for all your life. Would that agent be a moral agent? Kant wants to say, I think Rousseau would say, and I think they're both right. No. At no point have they really asked themselves what was it. They've never tried to fabricate for themselves the justification. They've done the worst thing possible. They've outsourced their moral responsibility. If you don't outsource it, it comes from inside. Explain a little bit better what that might mean. 
Uh, this story is actually a story that uh, was being uh, accounted by um, Franz de Waal, who is a primatologist and has been looking at uh, chimpanzees and bonobos and gorilla and stuff. And he's written some uh, really <coughs> interesting and popular books about the origin of morality in the Roman primates. And this story uh, concerns a group of chimpanzees, Catholic chimpanzees. And um, I'll, I'll, change, uh, I'll change the names uh, uh, just for, for a little bit of fun. Uh, so uh, the chimpanzees group have uh, a dominant structure. And there is the alpha that dominates the whole group. And um, a high, high striking animal in the group. And then there are, uh, below the alpha, there are all the males. And then below all the males, there are all the females. So this is the structure. In this story, uh, so let's call the alpha alpha. Okay. And um, uh, there is a female, which is also uh, important in the story. Let's call it alpha. And there is a, a, a juvenile uh, male, a young uh, chimpanzee, and we'll call it uh, Bernie. Okay. <laughs> so what happens? So um, one day, um, um, Alfie has been I've been trying to um, mate with Coco, but Coco, for some reason, didn't want to meet him, to mate him with him that day. And so uh, Alfie was quite annoyed, um, uh, because he's, he's the alpha of the group, so normally uh, uh, the other members of the group are very wretched. Um, you should know that chimpanzees, um, the dominant structure is very important. And for example, um, when the non-dominant males meet the alpha male, uh, they have to signal the submissiveness, they have to signal the fact that they are not the alpha, that they recognize the authority of the alpha. They do it all the time. If they meet the alpha like 20 uh, times uh, in a day, they, you know, every time they will uh, bow and, and show the submissiveness. They, they do it all the time, they have to do it all the time. Uh, so Alfie is very uh, annoyed. Uh, later in the day, he finds out that uh, Coco um, has been uh, mating with uh, the juvenile, Bernie. Right? And so now he's really, really, really annoyed. <laughs> and uh, normally, this kind of behavior uh, of the juvenile is uh, it's not a big deal. The juveniles don't, the young chimpanzees don't, can, they're not a threat to the authority of the alpha male. And so normally, the alpha male kind of uh, says, okay, okay, so it doesn't uh, punish the juveniles, can find the young chimpanzees behavior in a way that he doesn't like. But in this particular occasion, perhaps because of what had happened before the end of he's really annoyed. And so um, he uh, starts uh, going after um, Bernie uh, with very, uh, very aggressive uh, intention. And also you should know that um, alpha uh, males, alpha chimpanzees, they're very strong and they can really, uh, they bite and they can really uh, uh, Inflict very uh, profound wounds, deadly wounds. Right? Um, and so, what happens? Bernie is um, obviously uh, very scared, so he starts uh, running away. He has a diarrhea attack uh, as a result of the fear. Uh, but um, Alfie doesn't give up, and so he keeps going after him, trying to, trying to uh, catch him so that he can punish him with violence and pain. Um, and this goes on for a while. At some point, some of the females, um, they start producing a particular kind of a bark. It's called the wild bark, which is a bark they produce when, um, someone, when there is an, an aggressor, uh, when someone is annoying them in some particular kind of way. And at the beginning, it's just a few of the females uh, producing this kind of bark. Of course, no one is annoying them. No one is being aggressive towards them. But uh, the alpha is being aggressive uh, towards them. Um, so some, a few of them start producing this, uh, this sound, and uh, slowly all the females are joining. At, and at some point, so the bar says at some point um, there is a deafening chorus. Uh, the, all uh, the females are producing uh, this sound. And what happens, which is very interesting, which the bar says he had never observed before, is this. Suddenly, Alfie the alpha stops, uh, he stops going after uh, Bernie. And not only he stops, uh, but also he starts looking 
submissive, and also it produces a particular kind of green that the chimpanzees produce when they are uh, when they are in a state of fear, when they are afraid of something. And it's normally uh, you know, the submissive posture, this kind of green, the green of fear, is not one that you normally see in alpha males. Alpha males they have to show that they are the dominant male all the time. Well, in this particular occasion, they are submissive. It's as if the whole group has made the alpha submissive. Right? Or the whole group of females has made the alpha <coughs> submissive. Um, the weak in the group, the subordinates in the group, in this particular occasion, are dominating uh, the alpha. So the alpha is being uh, dominated. Now, why is this important? Well, it can be argued that this is the um, the origin of morality. This kind of behavior, which is relatively um, unusual uh, in, uh, in chimpanzees, arguably becomes very, very common and very, very important in human evolutionary history uh, during the late Pleistocene, when our ancestors were hunter gatherers, they lived in egalitarian hunter gatherer bands. They had to neutralize, to tame, <coughs> uh, some people say to domesticate. The bullies, the alphas, they would be dominant, um, they would be despots. Um, the bands, the, the bands around together is that weren't able to do this, uh, weren't doing very well, they didn't do very well. Uh, while the bands around together is that were effective at neutralizing, taming, domesticating the alphas, they would be dominant, the bullies, they were very successful. And so you can see that there is an evolutionary kind of natural selection component here in that certain kinds of groups uh, fit better, were more successful than other kinds of groups, and the differential success explains why a certain kind of behavior became more common. So this is the winning <coughs> ingredient in the story. Um, I can tell you a lot about why in that particular uh, chunk of human evolutionary history uh, the neutralization of the alphas uh, was important. Um, we don't have time. Uh, it has to do primarily with the kind of subsistence strategy uh, that was adopted by our ancestors uh, at that time. It has to do with the fact that uh, large game hunting at some point became really, really important in human history. And that's why I've written an article which is, uh, the title is uh, Meat Made Us Moral. Because it's because of that kind of subsistence strategy that certain uh, important ingredients of morality became common and entrenched in, um, in our species. Of course, uh, right, so there is also, um, um, I mentioned at the beginning, there is also a cultural component. So these bands were bands of um, um, uh, individuals uh, that were able to cult cultural transmission, they had an ethos, and their ideas about what was important for uh, efficient cooperation clearly played a role in the construction of the entire <coughs> ethos that was important, for the, that was the, the tool that kept the uh, alphas uh, submitted. So the rank and file uh, was able to uh, keep uh, the alphas in check via a culturally produced uh, egalitarian ethos. And also uh, they were able to do this via weapons. So, um, if, you, if you have weapons, if you live in a society where we weapons are available, um, then physical force becomes much less important uh, than it previously was. You can easily kill an alpha, even if you're not uh, very strong, if you have uh, efficient uh, weapons that you can use, for example, while the alpha is sleeping, while the Udi dominant is sleeping. Um, so, and of course, uh, weapons are an artifact and being cultural transmission is very important in the kind of process. Okay, just to uh, conclude, uh, so Nietzsche talks about the um, morality as being the result of uh, the revolt of, of this place. Well, if what I said is correct, in a sense, it was right, uh, in a sense, certain important ingredients of morality come from the fact that uh, the rank and file at some point in human history uh, was able to neutralize uh, the would be dominant uh, individuals. Um, now, of course, Nietzsche, when he talks about the origins of 
morality, when he talks about slave morality. He's referring to a particular uh, time in history. He's talking about, he talks about Judaism, he talks about uh, Christianity as the origin of uh, the, the slave uh, re revolt. Well, that he got, uh, he got from. So um, these individuals, these ancestors, these human ancestors, they were alive um, about anything between uh, 200,000 uh, years ago and 400,000 years ago. Um, certainly there was no Christianity then, there was no Judaism then, and arguably there was no religion then. Religion came about later on in, in history, uh, maybe 30,000 years ago, maybe 20,000 years ago, because there are debates and things. Um, so religion came about much later, and um, um, what happened when religion came onto the scene? Well, um, you might argue that, um, or at least some people have tried to argue that religion, when religion came to the scene, religion kind of took away morality as a tool from the hands of the rank and file. And so it was a way for the elite to kind of take this tool away from the hands of the rank and file. Um, so morality, in a way, can be seen as a if that's why morality can be seen as an invention of the 99%, but then as a tool that, well, while it was invented by the 99%, at some point it got stolen uh, by the elite, and so it became a tool of the 1%. And now, if that's right, again, you can think about how morality uh, works, and kind of all the various ways in which it can be used, and also the various ways in which it can be used. It has been used, and also all the various ways in which it can be Today. And, um, and of course, you know, there are big questions about what use we can make it in the future. And but I will leave that to, to you. I should stress that we can't use the Tim's real names for data protection. <laughs> so our final speaker is Professor. Go through the reasoning process that's led me directly to the truth. But trust me, I don't 
just will have differing views about what makes life worthwhile. Which doctrines to follow, what is good and right, where morality comes from, and how, if at all, it gains its special authority. We endorse different comprehensive doctrines, says Rawls, Catholicism, Utilitarianism. And disagreement is going to persist, inevitably, in this kind of context, because our answers to these questions depend on a wide range of factors. For example, the relevant factual evidence is difficult to assess, and reasonable people will disagree about how to interpret it, and how to weigh up competing considerations against one another. And also, how we understand and evaluate this sort of evidence depends on various things about us, about the lives that we've led up to this point. We've had different experiences, and we respond to this sort of material in different ways. And these are very difficult questions, and it's hard to weigh up the relevant considerations. So given that I do actually have the answers, but some of you will never agree with me, what am I, your humble leader, to do? And this is the big question, because we have to do something. We have to act in the world. As individuals, we need to make decisions about seemingly ethical questions every day of our lives, questions about what to believe and what to do. And most of us don't have the option of avoiding these sorts of questions while continuing to live in the world. And as social and political actors living in community with others, we face all kinds of questions about how to organize our common lives. In politics, we need to answer vital questions about how to arrange our common institutions. So we can't ignore these questions. They're not just academic questions with no real world significance. We need some rules, my people. And within any one society, we need a set of rules for everyone. Without that, to paraphrase Thomas Hobbes, things will get very messy very quickly. And what's more, when thinking about political society, we want, says John Rawls, stability over time, which will require the majority of you, my people, to willingly follow the rules. And we also need, in a democracy, to worry about the legitimate exercise of political power. To enforce the rules, we're going to have to use coercive political power. And in a democracy, that is the power of all of us, collectively. So how can I, or any other group, marshal this power legitimately to make people do things they don't want to do when they disagree quite reasonably about what's right. Okay, so here are some of the options that lie in front of me. First of all, I can just continue to try to convince you that I am right about these things by sheer force of rational argument. But I've already said that some reasonable people among you, unfortunately, will continue to disagree with me. So that's out. Okay. I could, second, try to bring you over to my side via force of personal <coughs> charisma, or through powerful rhetoric, or perhaps even via the medium of expressive dance. <laughs> but sadly, I think even these, despite my very best efforts, won't convince all of you. And anyway, that's hardly likely to foster stability over time, or to issue in the legitimate use of political power, so that's out. Right, okay, third, I can coerce you. Okay, well, not me on my own. But I could do what countless political leaders before me have done. I can try to make the people do what I know is right with the support of the military and the police and all the other state apparatus at my disposal. After all, I am right about these things. And if we care about doing the right things, shouldn't we just get everyone to do them, maybe with a little bit of coercion? Well, the trouble is that doesn't really sound like the legitimate use of democratic power, does it? And also, I'm a reasonable person, and I don't want to use my power to force you to do things that you don't believe or endorse. And also, we know how that tends to end with persecution, suffering, conflict, bloodshed, and I just don't want that on my hands. So that's all. Fourth option. We can accept the fact of reasonable 
reasonable pluralism and try to find some points of basic agreement in order to ward off the threat of conflict and allow us to live together on the terms that all reasonable people can be expected to accept. That sounds good, doesn't it? So, let's try number four. Given the fact of reasonable disagreement, how are we going to find some points of overlap? Well, and I'll be quick. Rawls argues that we can find some points of agreement within the public political culture of democracies and the institutions, the traditions, the texts that inform our public life. And there are ideas within that public political culture which can form the basis for us of a common political conception of justice. And this is something we can all get on board with because, one, it only applies to our political lives and our political institutions, so you can live the rest of your life unbothered. Two, this kind of thing is freestanding, meaning it doesn't depend on your endorsing any particular controversial conceptions of the good or comprehensive doctrines. And finally, third, it comes from something, the public political <coughs> culture, which we all share, we all have in common, we all have a stake in. So this way, citizens, we can fashion for ourselves a common political morality which helps us here and now to make decisions about how we ought to organize our social lives in a way that doesn't depend on controversial answers to fundamental questions and which can be stable over time. And we can legitimately exercise political power to uphold these institutions and commitments. In short, we can continue to disagree about where morality comes from and what we ought to do even though some of us may be right, like me, and some of us may be wrong, like you. <laughs> and yet we can live together under a common framework that all reasonable people can accept. So I hope at least I've managed to convince you of that without having to try my hand at expressive films. <laughs> Surely it's not true to say that morality originated with the slave revolt. Slave, slave morality originated with the slave revolt. But before that, the masters have their own morality, and master morality predates slave morality. But more than just predating slave morality, master morality inevitably leads to the creation of slave morality. So that reveals that there's a fundamental conflict in human morality where you have mass morality and that inevitably leads to slave morality. So what exactly could the, could the say, evolutionary foundation be for this fundamental moral conflict? I don't know if any of you are familiar with the RK selection theory of culture and politics. The view that politics is essentially gene wars between more R-selected gene sets and K-selected gene sets. I don't know if that could be an explanation for this fundamental conflict. What do you think? Uh, okay. Okay. So, um, um, so you're right. So Nietzsche talks about uh, slave morality and master morality. Um, the way I used those kind of thoughts was just to point out a certain particular uh, set of events in human history that I think have been important for uh, kind of bringing about what we, now, what we now call morality. Of course, moral values are not the only values there are. There are uh, non-moral values um, uh, that can predate moral values. And one idea behind the theory I presented is that political values and um, also all kinds of individual selfish values uh, predate uh, the existence of, of morality. And so, um, of course, then one needs to look exactly at the details of exactly what it is that came about during that particular time of human, that particular segment of human history, uh, during which our ancestors 
<coughs> we're living in egalitarian bands that we're trying to neutralize, to tame and domesticate uh, the others. But there are important details there that I, I think we shouldn't go into today. Okay. So, who's up? Uh, yes, gentlemen here, just uh, three rows from the front. Uh, we have to wait for the traverse of the motor. It's coming down from the line. Uh, we'll descend upon. <coughs> so, I'm interested in um, thinking about what morality is good for, in the sense that uh, if we take the Aristotle on a political approach, the end is happiness, as you say. But if we go with what Professor Fine was talking about, what morality is supposed to give us is peace and stability. So that, and, and in some sense, that goes with the evolutionary approach also. It's a social good and that it allows us to live together in ways that perhaps then give us a chance not to be in the world and then give us a chance to be happy. So I, I guess I'm just interested in thinking about uh, the divide there, where I guess the world's point of view wants to say that happiness is your own affair, not necessarily. happiness without worrying about your neighbor coming in and you know, lobbing you over the head or saying what you're doing is the wrong thing you have to be my path, my, my path, or your other path. Um, and how then that would play off against the focus on happiness in the groups. Good, yeah. Um, so some of the virtues such as justice, for instance. But some of the virtues, like moderation, no one is harmed if I gorge on cake. Um, but um, for Aristotle, it would still be the case that um, it would be well, immoral uh, for me to do that. And I'm the only person who's harmed by that because I'm thereby um, acting against um, the virtue of moderation that I would otherwise foster or have and thereby <coughs> be a happy person. So um, I think this political aspect is definitely very strong in both Pat and Aristotle, but I don't think it's exhausted um, in the account of the virtues. But um, I think that for 
Kant, it's important that this kind of relates to the question relating morality and happiness. He does see a danger in starting off with questions like, what is morality good for? Absolutely nothing. Uh, so, it, it, and thank God, uh, because it shouldn't be done for any other reason. <laughs> if you're doing the right thing, you do it because it's the right thing to do. That should be, as the very most one can do, as the very least one can do. And pictures where they try to frame, the, philosophical pictures where they try to frame the value of morality in, in different, larger pictures, like the stability of society or divine approval, he thinks any of those kind of stories end up distorting what the core of morality actually is. So it's a tricky job to bring religious belief back in, as he wants to do, but uh, indeed he does. I think he's quite influenced by, uh, perhaps surprisingly, someone like uh, John Milton who in Paradise Lost uh, said, you know, uh, there was a question, why did, you make, why did you make these people free at all? Why don't you just like set them on a program to do the right thing? Wouldn't that be better? Like we just automatically all do the right thing? He said, well, if they're not free to fall, if they're not free to make mistakes, if they're not free to fail to do the right thing, what value is it when they actually get it right? <coughs> and there's, so you end up saying you don't know everything, you just, you're, it's up to you at the end of the day, and you win divine approval, not by looking to God and deciding what to do, but to look to yourself. I should say, John has written a monograph that might help him as he might have written It's the perfect stocking for me. Um, Don't say that, so I've got an Elizabeth one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, questions, anyone at the top? Every year I do this and I forget. Yes, so do you think we can get, can we get that microphone? It's the affected attitude that you have towards it. You must really be disgusted by even entertaining this thought. And only then, Aristotle thinks, um, you reach practical truth. So, and that seems very plausible. I think similarly, uh, I find it plausible that there are moral facts as well. Um, I think uh, one thing that I like about Kant, though I don't end up endorsing his picture of just why there are and how we know them. But part of what I like about his attitude is a bit like what uh, Sarah was saying. When you're doing philosophy, you have to start off somewhere. You have to take something that you're going to view as relatively plausible against which you might 
evaluate other things. It's hard to know how to get going otherwise. Um, and as I briefly alluded to in my talk, sometimes I wonder about theories that end up with the conclusion or the possibility that there are no moral facts. I find it rare that any of the steps of those theories are more compelling than the initial thought that there are moral facts. So that's the bar. It's, I mean, I mean, it's not a great argument, but it's a start of an argument that a standard for an, ar uh, an argument that there are no moral facts should be have, have more compelling steps in it than the thought, the common <coughs> thought that Rousseau would say that we recognize every day when we do use these moral terms. Okay. You say, are you convinced or? No. no. <laughs> Got it. So you think there aren't any more of that? It depends on the underlying assumption. The underlying assumption that the course is paying is wrong, which is a decision. If you make that decision to your utility and your beliefs and the dollars of the portion, it's wrong. You have to make that whole uh, It has to start somewhere. And I suggest it starts with what I thought you were saying. I'm sorry. That ultimately, Whatever source of moral ideas that you come across, unless it passes through the filter of your own decision as being the right thing, it has to be your decision. You evaluate it, so it's ultimately a subjective evaluation. Even if you can persuade everyone else to agree with you, it's still a subject, not a objective fact. Okay, okay. So, uh, yeah, up the top. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, from this, uh, um, what are the three most uh, valuable attributes a leader can have. But I'll say it for two. Well, what are the three? Presumably moral attributes rather than just. Yes, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> 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 Decisive. Okay. Okay. What are we looking for now? Maybe we'll make a better think about that. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to come back to Can we get, uh, who has the microphone? Do you think we get the microphone up the back there? So the uh, last row, yeah, jump in here in the center, last row. You can just wave your hand so they can all see you. Yes, fantastic. Um, I actually wanted to ask a question to Dr. Fan as well. Um, how does Rawls believe um, political um, agreements are reached in um, political systems that are not democracies? Yeah, that's a good question. He doesn't spend much time talking about how agreement is reached in political systems that are democracies. So he wants to leave open the potential that other political systems can be legitimate, but when he's talking about theories of justice, he focuses primarily on constitutional democracies. So he does <coughs> open the possibility that there are ways of governing society that don't require the endorsement of their <coughs> members and that can still be legitimate, but in order to have a political conception of justice that meets the terms that I've spoken about and that's going to be stable <coughs> and legitimate, we need to have a democratic framework. While you're how's the thought, do you want to do three attributes on each <laughs> Goodness me. Um, humility. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the courage of one's convictions and Never having accepted any money from Lord Ashcroft. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, we go to the middle here. So, so it's uh, yeah, no, down here. So, yeah. So you can just wave your hand about so they can see you. Hello, this is directed at you, Sasha. Uh, at the end of your speech, you talked about the implications of Nietzsche bringing to our attention that morality may well be fabricated, um, that we could perhaps change some and value some more, value some less. Has that actually happened? 
um, since Nietzsche sort of busted the myth and let us all know that morality is fabricated. And surely the argument that it hasn't happened is the greatest evidence against um, thinking that morality is fabricated. And secondly, in, Nietzsche, in Nietzsche's genealogy, do you think that we could put in another step and maybe that there's a potential change in, well, there's, another, there's a refabrication of morality going on now, maybe with Christianity not having such a role in society anymore? Sure, so, I mean, I think the first question, does morality in fact change, has it changed since he wrote? It seems to me it's gone through extraordinary changes. I mean, if you look at... Um, <clears throat> the role of the notion of duty, of doing one's duty, okay, so that's clearly a central portion of, at least because <coughs> popular culture, of what you should be doing. But I wouldn't imagine it's something that's much appealed to now by most people in everyday discourse. Instead, you've got other notions coming in. So, for example, authenticity. So you often hear a kind of discourse where the most important thing is to be yourself, okay? As long as you've been yourself, that's okay. Don't be a fake, you know, be who you really are. And see, that's, where's that come from? What's this notion of being yourself, what is, you know, what does that mean? What is this true self we're meant to be? And how have we got to that rather than do your duty? And do your duty might require that you don't be yourself, okay? It might require that precisely you suppress all your great hopes and dreams because you do your duty, you follow your station, you know, and then whatever the particular position you have. So I think it has gone through enormous, extraordinary changes, and not just since he wrote it. There's a really nice, um, I can't remember exactly which lecture it's in, there's a really nice example of Fuku figures where he's uh, talking about why you shouldn't cheat on your wife. Um, and he goes through all these gross Greek texts explaining why they shouldn't cheat on their wife. And his point is they're all giving very different answers. So for some of them, you shouldn't cheat on your wife because it's <coughs> against the natural order of things. Some shouldn't cheat on your wife because it's irrational. Um, and for some of them, you shouldn't cheat on your wife because you're trying to be a leader. And if you show that you can't control yourself, no one will follow you. So you've got these very different, even within you know, this very small period of time, radically different understandings of what we're doing, what we're doing morality. And I think, you know, particularly in the Nietzsche case, the idea that, um, that you can't now have a religious backing for morality, and that that's deeply problematic in some way. You know, I think a lot of people do genuinely feel something like, well, if morality isn't sent by God, whatever the name of your God is, then its, it's status is dodgy in some way. You know, if you think of this kind of modernist idea that without God, everything is permitted. So I think he did put his finger on something very significant that there's some, we have some kind of residual worry, and maybe it's a worry we shouldn't really have, we have some residual worry that the loss of this kind of divine backing is a problem, you know, does it make morality a bit soft if it's just what I think or what if you think something different? So I think you put his finger on something very profound, I think our, the first order, our morals, have changed very greatly since you <coughs> and I guess so just to pick up on your point about Christianity, in a way I think that's sometimes the problem with it, you know, a lot of what he's writing about the worry is this kind of suffocating, stifling Christianity. Um, and, you know, so he's very worried that the big problem is everyone's suppressing their desires and no one's enjoying life or using, you know, really reveling in the sort of animal instinct. Um, and it just seems that whatever the current problem <coughs> with our society, it would be strange to say, of course, that everyone was suppressing their desires too much. Okay, so I think, in a way, his, you know, the loss of Christianity, the decline of Christianity is a problem for him because his target it's gone. Some degree, I um, so hope that answers that. Okay, we had, yes, use, uh, can we get, so by whatever mechanism we can convey the mic to the middle of that? <coughs> oh, you've got abundance. <laughs> Many. Um, it seems that a lot of this discussion has been um, both about descriptive ethics and normative ethics. And we, we seem to be discussing a lot about how uh, morals come about and what morals there are in certain societies and things like that. And then afterwards, we apply those morals that we find, those values that we find in certain societies, and say that's how we ought to behave. Um, it seems like there's a sort of is but dilemma here. Is there a way that we can solve that somehow? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so for Aristotle, um, in a way, he derives, or at least partly derives, the um, moral um, convention, the moral norms from nature. And for Aristotle, nature itself isn't um, something that you can describe. 
Um, I didn't uh, go into that, but he distinguishes between first and second nature, where first nature is basically um, you know, us being animals and the sort of stuff you need to do in order to survive. But second nature, that's something that's, um, uh, that needs to be formed, um, something that um, is in a way self-reflective, what could it be? And um, still, Aristotle thinks that um, we as creatures who have this uh, malleability um, can then use the well reasoning um, that we um, use to well think about our nature to well in a way shape our nature. So that way, um, and so and since he thinks that the um, the moral norms hang on this nature, um, he I don't think faces the is not a um, problem at the junction where it goes from. Nature is the is, and then we go to morality, and that's the art. Okay. Once again, if there's anyone who wants to talk, hi. Um, I'm going to try and put this as clearly as I can actually formulate it, because it seems like I'm in the first place. Um, I was wondering um, to everyone on the panel if um, you could speak a little bit um, on. Um, to what degree, if at all, does ethics differ as we're ontologically um, from the collectivistic mindset and the individualistic mindset? This is to say, like, I mean, it seems like something is uh, assumed before we start constructing an ethics either in a group setting or an individual setting. So before we decide how to construct a model, we have to decide I mean, there's a moral question there before we even decide how to construct morality. Uh, so, how is it different if it is different between the two cases? And if that doesn't make sense, just let me know. I think it does make sense. Your, your picture of where you're beginning oh. could vary quite different culturally. But I suppose um, one might want to ask just how much variation one really thinks there is. And I, in one sense, where you're starting with gives you your data, and then you want some kind of theory to explain that data. Now, is that data very, very diverse culturally, or is there some quite a lot of homogeneity? Is there a core to that data? I hear the data is just what we think our, our responses are from the core of the model. And with certain philosophers, and I think a lot of philosophers, they think that there is quite a strong core of that data that survives, or at least has a close family relations and different cultural variations, whether it's indiv more individualistic backgrounds, more collectivist ones. So I think uh, whether or not that's a justified assumption is another claim, but again, I kind of go back to to start somewhere. I think just I want to, in relation to just to the previous questions, and it relates to this as well, there's, for Kant, you're never going to like come up with some new moral truth as a result of doing philosophy. If you do, then be suspicious of that philosophy. Right? It's, it's a bit like, oh, I never knew that. I had to, you know, uh, do, I had to not kill people. I never knew it. Um, so there's, it's important how you, I think, for philosophers when they're talking about the fabrication of morality, like to think about just what their role is. It's certainly it's to tell a story about what that might be. Uh, and there are many different stories. But it doesn't eliminate morality, that data that we started with, and it doesn't, it's rare that a piece of philosophy throws out these, uh, these pieces of data, like one shouldn't harm others needlessly. Uh, rather, it just changes our conception, changes how, how central we view them to our lives, how, how, how much we weigh them, how easily we diverge from them. And I think I'm quite optimistic for philosophy. I think actually it still has a role to, uh, to combat certain forces that can lead you to take these questions less seriously. Yeah, just very briefly, so um, in a way this goes back uh, to the question about uh, whether there are moral facts. Um, so here's one view. Uh, morality kind of speaks to you with a particular kind of voice, right? And <coughs> how can we, is there a way to vindicate the authority of morality, to vindicate that tone of voice? And so, so one idea is that we appeal to God. 
Um, another idea is that we appeal to the community. Um, neither of those ideas seem to be to work. So if you ask people, well, do you think it would be right to torture babies <coughs> if God said it was okay? People say, no, it would still be wrong. Do you think it would be right to torture babies if everyone in your community said it was okay? Then people say, no, it would still be wrong. Right? So then there's a question about whether we can vindicate this particular authoritative voice of morality. And um, that seems to be kind of very difficult. That is the challenge for those who believe in, in moral facts. There are all sorts of facts that we talk about when we use moral language, facts about cooperation, facts about <coughs> relationships, and so on. Uh, but, but that's not enough, right? We want a vindication of that particular kind of authoritative voice. And, um, well, it seems to me that you know, various philosophers have told us those interesting things that suggest that it may not be possible to vindicate the authoritative tone of morality. And if that's the case, then we need to decide what to do with it. Can I say something very briefly about torturing babies? <laughs> I think we've got to stop talking about it, really. I really do. I mean, we, we go to the most extreme examples when we're looking for other moral facts. And it's like you want to test whether there is, like this bowl is good in the microwave, so throw it into a volcano. <laughs> Most of the, what we want to know are like are our ordinary, everyday responsibilities to each other being met. Not the extreme examples, not like if 10 people are on a trolley and it's going down this way, and if you pull a lever, it's going, I don't, once, once I make, I don't know. <laughs> Lots of philosophers don't know. But what there is possibility to do, I think, is to talk about whether the less extreme examples, the Morality talk, as it features in our everyday lives, has the weight that it ought to have, and um, and I think there is. Uh, Should we bump Syria? <laughs> that is kind of everyday kind of example, but it's also kind of extreme because it kind of brings up all sorts of very important, difficult issues. And so the extreme examples can be useful. I, I think they can be useful, but I don't think <coughs> not for philosophy. So I don't think, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not going to ask any philosophers whether we should bomb Syria or not. I think we should. I can ask philosophers that if there, there's a moral question and that an aspect to it. We should ask questions about foundations of morality. Um, political philosophers can tell you what your political responsibilities are. Give you theories of that as well. Uh, extreme examples have their place, but non-extreme examples have their place as well. I want to say and. Whenever we're asked, if we go straight to the extreme, and the worrisome thing, I think, are that we might be neglecting our non-extreme moral examples. They're the, the, the everyday failures of morality that I think are much more common than the examples that we tend to talk about. Kind of okay, so we have time. We have time for two more questions. So who wants to <coughs> look up? Uh, it seems to me that a lot of uh, things controversial in these sort of voices that give you more facts in your head. Uh, they come from pride, prejudice, or racism, or other things that, you know, other vices you might have. Yeah. Only God as you've grown up. Are there any, have you got any, uh, do you acknowledge that or are there any tools that you know that people can use to distinguish between things that are genuine right things to do or things that maybe they're informed by prejudice or something like that? John here's the boss, let's see. I'm just, it was, it was a preoccupation of Kant's as to whether one could distinguish that voice. It was well known even by Kant's time that these voices might just be internalized voices from your conventional background telling you a voice in your head saying don't do that, a bullying super ego telling you uh, you're being bad now and they're wondering who is this voice? Who's, who's telling me to do all these things? Should I, should I listen to it? And I'm afraid it's not a particularly satisfying answer that Kant came up with at the end. He said there's absolutely no way to distinguish infallibly that that voice that you're hearing is the real deal. <laughs> you have to kind of make a judgment. Again, he'd say, 
what do you want? Mm. An algorithm to tell you, yes, that boy's telling you to, to help that person in need is the real, real deal. Why don't you just ask yourself? I mean, it's interesting because a lot of the sort of thought experiments you said are basically trying to isolate what the factor is. You know, think of all these cases where some guy is drowning and you walk past him and you don't go and help because you don't want to ruin your shoes or whatever. And everyone says you're a monster. <coughs> but you're not a monster if you don't send 20 quid to Oxfam, even though it would likely save more lives. So a lot of the short experiments you see in the gospel are trying to isolate basically how can you tell good intuitions from bad intuitions. And you want to say, well, if the only difference between the two cases is that the person dying in the Oxfam case is an on their way and I've got a mail and an envelope, that doesn't seem like a morally salient distinction. Whereas you might think, for example, if the issue is well, did in one case I pushed him in the pond, and in another case I was just coming past, then maybe that's a morally salient distinction. So maybe, you know, uh, in one case I intended to kill the patient, and in another case I just performed an operation that I knew might have a high likelihood of bringing back to death. So I think a lot of what you see in the kind of literature is attempts, I guess like some of the experiments, to isolate out what's the ringing on moral alarm bells. And sometimes you may think it's significant, but sometimes, it's like the Oxfam case, you may think, well, how could it possibly matter that the person who's dying is 5,000 miles away or 5,000 miles away? How could that be a morally salient difference? But then if that's right, we're all monsters. None of us are selling all our stuff like that, at least most of us. <coughs> so do we have one question? Not the last, the last slide. Yes. Do we get our microphone? Uh, my interpretation of Kantian deontology is that God is required for morality to be meaningful because if, or else there's no sense of punishment to not be moral. So in assuming that we're living in a quite secular world right now where there's not really a sense of ultimate judgment from God, then does, does it still mean that morality is meaningful even if we don't know what morality is to follow? Like, um, I think, um, as I was saying earlier to the question regarding uh, Canton's theology, he has a complicated theory that he does think that God is required in there at some part. That's more of he thinks your your overall existential life needs a certain uh, you have a certain drive to certain large questions and they are connected to your moral life eventually and he thinks there is something quite uh, cosmic that you have to appeal to at the end of the day. Whether that is a personal God or not uh, I'm not sure. But one thing that he is sure on is that the, the role of God can't be to reward or punish for your moral behavior. Once you've done, once you've got that kind of story in there, then you're doing the right things to avoid uh, punishment and to win approval. And what we have to do, he talks about, he is an enlightenment thinker, he wrote about what is enlightenment, and he said, what is enlightenment? It's, it's uh, Growing out of your minority, that means being un stopping being underage, it's growing up. It's stop looking for a parent figure to approve or disapprove of one's behavior, but rather taking responsibility for one's. <coughs> yeah, so, I mean, actually, I mean, it seems, just a general answer, I mean, it seems that on the counter, if you knew that God existed, and then he was going to punish you, you think you would never be able to act tomorrow, because however well-intentioned you were, every time you went to help the needy person, you couldn't be helping that same guy and grabbing his up another round so, you know, if we were actually to have knowledge of God's existence, we kind of would be terribly destructive in that. We can never do the right thing for the right reasons, but always be instrumental as this kind of chalking up bonuses to come. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. So, if you could just join me in thanking the panel.